Assalamu alaikum. Instructor, I'm just trying to turn on the video. Alaikum salam. Take your time. All right. I'm <laughs> How are you? Thank you very much. How are you? I'm well. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can. All right. Very good. Very good. Good to finally have a face to face. <laughs> yeah, this is wonderful. So, uh, I'm to you for every year. And have, all is well. All is well here. And uh, it's early. <laughs> I don't usually get to bed until four in the morning. So consider yourself a very special person. <laughs> but it's all good. Well, I have, well, please. I have uh, a lot of work I, to do today. You did me a favor, actually, by getting me up this early. Yeah. I'm sorry. No, <laughs> no, don't be sorry. I get up from my meditations. I go back to bed and some of my uh, best elucidation comes around this time of, of the morning. So I'm I'm never really sleep around this time. I'm I'm in a, a midway point most of the time when the sun is coming up and it's just beautiful. The ideas that begin to pour in when your mind is not yet inundated by the world, you know. So this is good. I, I, what, what time I, is it where you are again? It's 11 p.m. p.m. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm on the opposite side. Yeah, yeah. So this, this is the best we could do, but it's great. It's great. I've been anticipating this meeting. Tell me a little bit about yourself before we get into whatever it is you want to discuss. So uh, I live in Australia. My parents are Turkish. They came from Turkey to Australia in the late 70s, mm -hmm. early 80s. I was born. Um, I grew up in Australia in a uh, suburb which... I wasn't so primarily Muslim. Um, later on, grew to a large Muslim population. Mm -hmm. um, so there's about 12 mosques where I am in mm -hmm. um, Melbourne. Uh, we grew, grew up there. We experienced racism and all that other stuff that you normally do, being yeah. different. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> my father, he's... He's from the military in, from Turkey. He's not. Uh, he was a commando when he was younger, so mm -hmm. he's got that hard military mm -hmm. uh, discipline. Gotcha. So we, yeah, we grew up very uh, disciplined. Let's say, you know. Yeah, um, I understand. He wasn't scared to use his hand. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but um, saying that. He sent us to a Catholic school, which I thank him so much. Mm, mm, mm. Because um, he, he thought that we needed a bit of, um, I guess, uh, I don't know, a challenge. Okay, that would be it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Catholic school is a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, he didn't see us doing well at um, a public school. He thought, he thought we'd end up being criminals. Right. Because most of the area was very um, crime ridden, yeah. drug ridden. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so I went to Catholic school. I didn't know much about my own religion. And that's where, because um, I was challenged. Uh, fortunately, when I was in year eight, which is, I don't know, the equivalent in America, mm -hmm. Ahmed Didak mm -hmm. came to give a lecture. Mm -hmm. And I was going to a Catholic school and I was a bit. I don't know, um, lost because they were telling me about Jesus being the savior. Right. right. All that and sort here, of stuff. And here you know, comes D -Dad. Hero, yeah. <laughs> Along comes Ahmed Didat. <laughs> Burst your bubble, huh? <laughs> yeah. yeah. But yeah. I was, yeah. So um, as in like, for me, it was like a superhero challenge. Muhammad versus Jesus. Yeah. Uh, when I was younger. And Ahmed Didat, he helped me. Um, uh, debate my religious teachers at um, the school that I was going to. And it got to a point where they got so frustrated with me, they called my parents because I was mm -hmm. using Ahmed Didat's books mm -hmm. under the table. Yeah. That they um, asked my parents, um, they didn't want me in the religious classes anymore. So they sent me to the library every time they had the religious classes because I was disrupting the other kids from learning their own yeah. religion, which yeah. they 
parents paid for. Right. In hindsight, I knew what I was like right now, what I was doing was wrong. It wasn't the way to um, show people the beauty of our religion. Yes. And, um, but I learned a lot. I learned to um, analyze the debate. I learned a lot about the Bible, Uh um, the differences in scripture with the Quran and, you know, how how it's um, written or delivered. Yes. And um, then later on, I started getting to um, my own religion. Uh, but I was learning it off a lot of Wahhabi, Salafi people. So I was getting oh boy. that oh boy. side. <laughs> yeah. But I knew in my heart it was wrong because the way they... It wasn't about the beauty of the Quran. It was a lot about, you know, the Prophet Muhammad did this, the Prophet Muhammad did that. Yes. And I was stuck there. And then I came across, because I, I read a lot, and um, um, I, I like broad range of topics. Mm-hmm. And uh, I came across Rashid Khalifa's uh, The mm-hmm. 19. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm very into my... Uh, Cipher, coding, that type of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, gram- grammatia, numerology, mm-hmm. mathematics. I had a very good, um, keen interest in mathematics, geometry, uh, sacred geometry. And I came across his works and Edip Yuxad, 19 questions for Muslim Yeah, Yeah, Edip, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's still going strong out there. Nineteen dot org, right? Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, mm-hmm. then that, and uh, that, that I don't know. It um, it it made me appreciate the Quran much more. Mm-hmm. A celestial tablet, you know. Um, yes. And um, when I understood the perfection and the um, how you can't take anything and in or out of the Quran has protected. Uh-huh. That for me was, you know, um, done. I'm done. Uh-huh. In my heart, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> yeah. But this is where I love you. This is where um, it was only numbers. For I, I've been, I've known about Rashid Khalifa since 1998. I let go uh-huh. of hadith, the Kaaba, the, all the rituals uh-huh. for a long time. Uh-huh. For me, I had no connection to the what the Quran was saying. I, with the translation, yeah, but it was only so far, you know. But you bringing in the seed letters, yeah. the actual, yeah. you know, meanings, the deeper meanings to it. And um, once you learn that, you know, pretty much with the fit, uh, <laughs> fitra, I didn't even know the meaning of fitra, you know. And most beautiful. Muslims don't. Most Muslims don't. Don't feel bad. <laughs> Well, most Muslims don't respect Mother Nature, you know. This is true. And um, yeah, that fit in. It was that. That was it, you know. Now I've got the actual um, connection with the Quran, with yeah. the meaning, the beauty of it, you know. And I'll get a deeper impact. Also, because I'm 42, I've had a in when I did find out about the hadiths. I isolated myself a lot from, you know, the community because it it was making me sick because I couldn't talk to people. I couldn't penetrate them. They were lost or the way I felt, you know, um, more in the cult mind. (laughs) And uh, I I went off the track. So I went off, I got into, you know, the usual, the drugs, the gangs, the (laughs) nightclubs and all of that stuff. And uh, heavy addictions, uh-huh. and um, uh, I ended up on opiates for about nearly I don't know about fifteen years. Mm. But through that experience, I got in touch with um, ceremonies, so um, like the ayahuasca ceremonies, the mm-hmm. five the MEO DMT yeah, ceremonies. I understand. And um, it helped me beat my addiction with the, the very hardcore stuff. And yes. now I'm married. I've got, you know, three kids. Under five. Alhamdulillah. I'm in, I'm in such a good place in yeah. my heart. Yeah, that's wonderful. And, yeah, with this new netics, I just want to um, learn it and pass it on to my kids. Okay. You know, I want them to um, grow up, 
you know, fascinated about the Quran, about yeah. love and nature. Yeah. yeah. yeah how long ago? How long ago were you, were you uh, in, uh, introduced to Nunetics? How long ago was it? So it was about last year mm -hmm. at the at the start. I think about last year about the start, and that was after I read Dan Gibson's book when I got married yeah, in um, yeah. China, Guangzhou. Mm -hmm. So I got married in that mosque, which was okay. pointing in another direction. Right, <laughs> Petra. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Because yeah. I looked it up, and I went, "Oh, you know." When I came across Dan Gibson's work, I was wondering if he was telling the truth. Right. And right. yeah. <laughs> And yeah. I got disillusioned and I was asking God, please give me, like, I don't want to die without knowing what the Quran is speaking about, mm -hmm. the, the jewels of the Quran. Mm -hmm. And I was, um, I've been a long time follower of Santos Bonacci. Yeah, he's, he's in your neck of the from, yeah. <laughs> Sure, sure he is. Yeah. Yeah. Into that is, is syncretism and, you know, joining mm -hmm. all the spiritual beliefs. Yeah. Linking yeah. It. yeah. Hermeticism, syncretism, you know, different different oh, ways yeah. of expressing that. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, don't we have one person in our ummah, just one <laughs> Yeah. That could tie this all up with the Quran. You know, yes. and I was searching and I came across you and I was like, Alhamdulillah. That's one Alhamdulillah, there's one person. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Yeah. Yeah. Alhamdulillah, yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. That's that's wonderful. Um, I don't know what to say, man. I'm so so uh, fascinated. I'm so I'm like, there's one person. <laughs> well, <laughs> there there are many. There are always going to be many people, you know. That I found. That I found. Yeah, yeah even uh, uh, in the days of the prophets, I believe there were still subsidiary people who had similar understanding. That were coming into mm -hmm. um, synchronistic types of understanding of of what was going on around them, but they didn't necessarily become the popular spokespeople for that for that idea. And this is why I say that the characters, if you will, that are given to us in Scripture, the Bible and the Quran, are archetypes. I believe that they are not um, necessarily indicative of individuals but a particular human spirit that Allah wants on this earth. And he continues to add to it with the additional prophets that have come to us throughout history. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, you know, there are proofs for that in the Quran, you know, I mean, if, for instance, if Muhammad is spoken of in the Quran as a mercy to all the nations, uh, all of the nations were not even known <laughs> two thirds of the earth wasn't even known 1500 years ago, you know? So how is he a mercy to all of the nations, to all of the worlds? I mean, all of the worlds hadn't even been discovered yet. So it means that whatever his mission was, it was supposed to extend way beyond his lifetime. And that could only happen if Muhammad was not limited to just being a physical body on earth for a particular number of years, 63 years or however many years they, they tell us. Um, Muhammad is a principle. Yeah. And uh, he's also spoken of in the Quran by the name Ahmed. Yes. From the mouth of Isa that they translate yeah. as Jesus. Yeah. Um, and there is Apocrypha related to that also in terms of uh, Jesus in the Gospel of Barnabas, I believe it is, who says that I will, there's one coming who I will not even be worthy of tying his shoe latch. And he said that his name would be Ahmed. So we hear these things and we're translating them into our modern vernacular. So when we hear his name will be, we think it's an actual person. When these names are actually titles related to the mission and related to the essence of the message that these people were bringing to humanity, not necessarily to just a local tribe or a local group or, or a nation per se, ethnically speaking, but they were actually missioned, this is my belief, to advance the human cause, that the human being is an evolutionary being, and that evolutionary being begins when 
the involutionary being ceases to be at its height. You may have heard me speak about the differences between involution and evolution. Yeah. yeah. So we're in the inv- we're in the evolutionary stage of the world's development. And uh, this is basically why uh, animals are not changing still into other forms of animals. You know, we had life in the oceans, as the Quran says, that all life began in the water. And that yes. that light, those life forms migrated, as you know, out of the water onto the land. And those life forms lost whatever was not necessary for the land. You know, our, our, our spinal fluid is one molecule away from seawater. Yes, that's what I've heard. That's what yeah. I've heard. Yeah. So oh, science can definitely back up the idea that uh, originally life forms began in that fluid that we call water. And um, so because of that, uh, life forms have lost their gills and, and their flippers or whatever else. They, you know, a good example of that right now would be, I guess, the catfish. Because they're sort of between the sea and the land right now, you know. Yeah. But um, because these things were once a part of our particular life system and the biology, we still have remnants of them. We have what they call yeah. vestiges, right? Speak. You can jump in at any time. Yeah, because I, I watched the documentary on the spinal fluid, the cerebrum spinal fluid. Yes. And when um, the human uh, embryo develops, it is the first fluid, I think. And the way our, the skull develops is similar to the end of a starfish. Yeah, okay. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but yeah, it, 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 it's actually pointing to something that that you're hinting at uh, in the syncretism and the hermeticism philosophy, and yes. that is is that all life is one. Yes, it's just that in Al Islam they bring it under the term Tawheed. Yeah, yeah exactly. See, now that's not a Quranic term, although the the the, the idea of Tawheed is all throughout the Quran. You know, particularly in Surah uh, Tulay you know, Kul Huwa Allahu Ahad, that Ahad is related to Tawheed. Yep. And uh, it's speaking to the, the, I hate to use the word oneness because it suggests a, a numeral that is followed by other numerals. So we can't refer to Allah as one necessarily. They translate it like that, but the best we can do is, is say that Allah is unique. He's singular and unique. So yes. there are two terms that we're working with when we're dealing with Tawheed and its connection to what's in the Quran. And that is this one that we're talking about now, Ahad, which is only mentioned once in the Quran, in that surah. How about that? A word that means unique is only mentioned once <laughs> in the Quran itself. <laughs> and then there's the uh, companion word, Wahid, Wahid. Yeah. All right. Now that's mentioned also in relation to Allah, and most people don't know the difference. They don't even know to ask that there's, or you know, is there a difference? But the difference is going back to the nunetics method. The difference yeah. is understanding the meanings for letters. So when you understand that <clears throat> the letter wow <clears throat> means to connect, it's a connector. Okay. If we were translating it into English, it would be the word and. Yeah. Right. Me and Metin went to the store, right? It it connects yeah. you with me or me with you. So wa means connect. So if wa is the first sound you hear in wahid, it means that Allah is still who he is as a singular and unique and independent <clears throat> essence or being or whichever way we translate it. There's no sufficient translation for what Allah is, but we know that it represents his connection to something. And it's actually his connection to us. When we say wahid, we're talking about Allah as he is connected to all things in creation, but particularly the human creation, because we are experiencing the greatest volume of evolution because of what Allah is doing through the ayat, through the instructions that he's sending to the human brain, to the human heart, the way he's bringing people like we are right now. We've never met each other. You're in Australia. I'm over here in North Carolina. 
but look at how we're communicating effortlessly. See, that's Wahid. He's the one who is responsible for the technology right. that makes this available to us. You know, so we, we have to uh, gradually get away from the false, phony, fictitious meanings for Quranic words and ideas that we've been under now for the past over 1,000 years since uh, these uh, false concepts were introduced to us as Islam, but they were introduced to us through a false medium, unfortunately. Now, I'm not one to do what some of these other people we've been mentioning have done in terms of the hadith and just, you know, sweep them all under the rug and say all of them are no good. And no, you know, wh whatever is good, whatever has helped a person to grow and do some self-evaluation, uh, some comparative analysis, you know, Muhammad, the prophet was like this, and I want to be like him. And, and, and I'm trying my best to be like him and handle my situations and my marriage and my children and my village or my family or my nation, the way he, uh, you know, exemplified no problem. All I say to that is that all of the examples you need for that are already in the Quran. If you're going to extemporary, sources okay that that's your choice but you can't say that that is divine knowledge that's the only thing you can't say that if your mother gave you some good advice it's a good advice you may have followed it and been successful maybe your father gave you some business advice and today you're a millionaire he gave you good advice but you can't say that it's divine advice <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's people all. like it it's simplified as well. That's what I feel. They they don't want to do their own work. They just that's, want to that's, simplify. That's 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 kind of like human nature. It's it's <laughs> one of the lazy. it's one of the weaknesses in human nature that the human being likes to do it the easiest way. You know, find the uh, easiest I'm a way. Culture, yeah. That's even a hadith, believe it or not. You know, if there are two yeah. ways to do something, choose the easier way. You know? that, yeah, that's what they say. But the Quran has. Uh, a different kind of advice for the strivers, you know, Allah says that uh, uh, certainly with the difficulty comes ease. I, I guess you need to do due diligence, you know, on yeah. yourself. Even if you buy a product, normally you have to do due diligence. You know? Yeah. We're talking about yeah. Uh, Iman here. And, yeah. You know, but if they're telling you that all of the diligence has already been done and there's no <laughs> more to do because the scholars of old did it for you, or your sheikh or your ulima or uh, whoever you're looking up uh, to, you know, they, they did it for you. Then what is there to, for you to do except go to work and come home and, and pay zakat? There's nothing else for you to do. Forget it. Studying the, 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 the people who do that professionally have already done that for you. See? Uh, so yeah. all we have to do is keep paying them to continue learning for us. We they don't want have... You in a, yeah, they want yeah. you in a state of lack. Yeah. Always. Yeah. yeah. Like yeah. the reptilian brain. That's yes, just, indeed. So that's the problem. The, 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 that's the problem. And the problem is also that they've hijacked the term. This is another problem I have with the people who promote, I call them so-called hadith now. Yeah. I, yeah. I can't refer to them as something that Allah refers to in his Quran in reference to the Quran. Allah calls that, you know, asanul hadith. He mm -hmm. calls the Quran the most excellent hadith. And then he asked the question, and what, and what hadith will you believe in after this? So yeah. Allah, when he revealed the Quran, he knew the challenge would come into the world of people who would invent sayings and tales and, you know, and, and introduce them by the name that he gave to the Quran itself. So it's yeah. like us calling something Al-Kitab. You know, I wrote some stuff, and this is Al Kitab. You know, well, that's not Al Kitab. The Quran says, you know, that is Al Kitab. You know, that is the book. That's not what you have is not the Kitab. Mm -hmm. So Muslims are not even awake enough intellectually to even challenge this mm -hmm. myth of uh, you know divine origin of hadiths and the sayings of these scholars and Muslim and Bukhari and Abu Dawood and all of these people who some of whom probably didn't even exist, and if yeah. they did exist. It doesn't mean they did that damage. It means that people are always looking to slap the name of a person that they think you respect on a work that they think you won't challenge because this one said it. This guy, he said it. That's what they did with Muhammad. See, yeah. all they had to do was say Muhammad said, and all of the Muslims would, you know, their their, their blood pressure would, would drop. <laughs> 
because because you feel funny arguing against Muhammad as much as we love Muhammad. We don't want to argue if they said Muhammad said it. Well, I don't know for sure if he did or didn't, but I'm not going to take a chance and say he didn't. And that's where the whole Muslim world is right now. You know, I don't know. I wasn't there a thousand years ago. I, I don't know if he said this or not, but I'm not going to take a chance with my soul to say something that might very well be against Muhammad. But you're going to take a chance with your soul to say things that are not in the Quran. Mm. See, so you don't want to buck Muhammad and what he might have said. But while you're accepting the bulk of these hadiths, you're, 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 you're what? I mean, how much damage are you doing against your understanding of the Quran? Especially when many of these hadiths are diametrically opposed oh. to what is in the Quran. It's amazing. Ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Like the, um, I just had a two days ago, a friend from Turkey called me and he was telling me because I don't pray that I don't know anything. And I said, okay, do you know that it came down from 50 rekat to five rekat? Mm -hmm. I go, do you know how that happened? I go, did you know Moses bargained with God for Muhammad? And he goes, mm -hmm. I don't be uh, ridiculous. He goes, Muhammad um, talked to God through a, a white cloth. And he mm -hmm. gave us the number of prayers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's okay, all I, kinds I, of versions because there's all kinds of aversions. Yeah, and I, <laughs> you know, if you believe one, you're gonna believe the other. It's all <laughs> you're believing in contradictions if you believe both. And then you have to ask who's hadith now, because the Sunnis have a version. The, the the you know the Shia they have a version of the hadiths. They have a version of the last uh, khutbah. Of the prophet, you know, where he says, you know, about believing in in the kitab and in him, and and then there's another verse that says, and the you know the the um, uh, the 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 Shiite version I'm speaking of now, where yeah. they include the family of Ali in that whole structure. So you uh -huh. know who who are you who are you going to believe? See. <laughs> Yeah, but it's the science, yeah, and then they use the science of hadith, which it's the science of gossip, because at the end of the day, it's a, um, the author, like Bukhari, was it even a book? Apparently, um, his original manuscript wasn't around. Someone uh, copied his manuscript called yeah. Ibn Farad. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. it's, it's suspicious from there anyway. Well, <laughs> anytime you, you uh, and see, if we would use our modern day thinking brains, this issue wouldn't even be an issue because if you yeah. were summoned to court and they put you on the witness stand and they asked you a series of questions and every answer you gave, when they ask you, where did you get that information? You say, oh, well, somebody told me, wait a minute, you weren't there to witness this? No, get out of this court. You don't belong. <laughs> you can't bring hearsay into the court. But these Muslims have brought hearsay into the court of Islam. And they've been doing that for, you know, better, about 1300 years now, bringing what they say somebody heard, who heard what somebody heard. And the thing is, Metin, even if you have the most sincere heart in the world, hearsay is weak by its very nature. You used to play that game in elementary school. Somebody I'm starts to come. Yeah. And whisper <laughs> into the ear of the person next to you in a circle. It could be just 10 people. By the time it gets back to you, it's a it's a different sentence all of the time. We tried it. Oh, yeah. every. We did it every day just as a regular classroom thing. And yeah. every single time it came back different. Now, it doesn't mean that the person who initiated it is an evildoer, you know. So we're not saying that the people who began hadith, they, I believe that they began hadith in a sincere effort to have these newbies that were coming into the deen after they left Arabia and went into Persia and these other places and Af places in Africa. They wanted these people to become better acclimated quicker to what the deen was. So they began to reduce a lot of what they were trying to teach these people into these modules. But I believe they made the mistake of saying, even if they were sincere, they made a, a a a very big error in slapping the name of the prophet on these things because they wanted these people to to not um, reject what they wanted to teach these people. So instead of saying, I say, by my own understanding of the dean, that this is how we should do this, there were too many people vying for leadership. 
too many people who wanted political and economic leadership over Muslims. So they're the ones who said, well, the majority of these people are going to be the ignorant and no matter what we do. So let's just develop a method, a quick method to get them to accept what we are saying should be the religion, because what we're saying is going to increase our coffers. It's going to it's going to increase increase their coffers. Is what it's, <laughs> it's going to increase our pockets. Our pocketbooks is going to increase our bank account. It's going to increase our power amongst yeah. these ignorant people. And when we need them for, for warfare, we don't want them to think twice about allegiance to what it is we're calling our religion. So a lot of that went into the into the pot and they started to stir that stuff around and then they regurgitated the information and gave it to the world as Islam, not Al-Islam, as the Quran calls it but Islam minus the definite article. So we don't have anything definite in the world. That's why we have all of these different versions of Islam. I totally agree with you. And um, like the modules, that reminded me of Scientology because I did the Nakhon program yeah. a long time ago yeah. for the detox. Yeah. <laughs> so I yeah. have to go through yeah. all the Scientology yeah. stuff. Right. We did the objectives. The open eyes, the um, close, but a lot of things I felt were taken from Islam as well, like from the Quran and yeah, yeah. Well, um, you know, a lot of things were taken from Islam, and a lot of Muslims like to highlight that. But I'm discovering that a lot of things that Islam says were taken from other sources, other older sources. Um, it's like I told. I, uh, I totally agree. I totally yeah, agree. Yeah, I, I tell. I tell. Like, yeah. Yeah. Continuation uh, of the divine source. You know? Yeah. It's, it's I, think, yeah. I think I've come across a pretty good uh, explanation for why they say the prophet married Aisha. And um, they say she was either, you know, six year, years old or, or seven, or something like that. So, but the point is, is that I believe that that language, especially since the Muslims were... within the um, community of uh, ancient Iranians that they came to call Persians, that a lot of the Persian message that they were preaching in Zoroastrianism seeped over into Muslim scholarship. I believe that. So there's no mentioning of Aisha in the Quran per se. So the only way that you would even know she existed is through the hadith. There's no mention of any of the wives per se in the Quran. There's not even a mentioning of the four major Sahaba. Yeah, yeah. Now this hurts the feelings of many Muslims because they think I'm saying that these people didn't exist, and I'm not saying that. If they did, Alhamdulillah. If they did not, obviously, if Allah left their names out of the Quran, they were not important for where it is Allah wanted Muslims to go. And where Allah wanted the world to go. And if you understand what they represent, here's the key. If you understand what those four major ones represent, then you'll know that they're all throughout the Quran. Because Allah gives generalized meanings for words, for characters, for people, for places. Yeah. You see? So you have to understand what the what the character represents. So give you a, for instance, if Abu Bakr is always touted as the one who was the most wealthy, the one who spent his money to free Bilal ibn Rabah, right? So his archetype is what we're talking about now. His archetype is that he represented wealth. Yeah. You see? Ali's archetype is that he represented scholarship. Okay. And then they include Aisha in that also, that she was, you know, the first woman scholar. That that, that can be argued with. And that that first wife that he married, they say Khadija, she had to be somewhat of a scholar herself to be that wealthy. <laughs> she at least had to be a, a you know, a, a, an economic scholar, you know, and a scholar of economics to be able to rule in a day when they say that men... Yeah, exactly. Uh, women were well, treated as sex So, so well, which, which is it? <laughs> were the women so suppressed and oppressed that they couldn't do for self and, and couldn't make decisions? 
or was it what I or was it what Khadija was? Which which one is it? You can't have both. Mm -hmm. You can't have both. So somebody's been misinformed at best and lying through their teeth at worst about much of the history. So it, because we weren't there, the best we can do is identify what should be for us as Muslims through what the Quran itself is establishing as knowledge. Exactly. That's why I love your work. Like, um, I, I, <clears throat> for years, I rattled my head with, you know, uh, all the hadith and this person and that person. And I let go of it. And I feel much better because I'm... I'm more so reading the Quran, like you said, reflect into Mother Nature, the Fitra, look for it within you, look for it, you know, outside of you. Yes. Within yes. Nature. Yeah. Well, you Let know, the I'll universe talk to you. Right. Form and right. function. You form yeah. and function. That's right. I was going to mention that uh, in the hijacking, as I call it, of the term hadith. Yeah. The, the plural word for hadith is ahadith. Okay. I don't know how many Muslims know that. We just say we out of out of English habit we say hadiths and we put an s on the end. But really, the plural in Arabic is ahadith. A h a d i t h. And now, you've heard what I've said about the a of negation. Yeah. Yeah, that it yeah. negates whatever comes after the a. If the a is on yeah. the beginning of a word, in most words, in Arabic and in English, it's true. Atheist, you know, amoral, yeah. asexual, yeah. apolitical, right? So a hadith follows that same rule. So does that mean nonverbal? Well, it means not hadith. Whatever, whatever no, it is, is, we know what it ain't. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the truth. <laughs> no, because hadith means narratives from Allah. Okay. Allah yeah, refers to, he, yeah. he uses the word hadith in the Quran, as I said. He says, and in what hadith after this, he refers to the Quran as hadith in several, on several occasions in several places of the Quran. The Quran is the hadith. And they yeah, hijacked yeah. that term and slapped it on the name of something that men invented as narratives and stories and all of the rest of that. So the so I, listen, so again, I'm not going to say sweep all of those things under the rug and what he said about loving your mother or your wife or what I'm not that's not what I'm saying. You don't take you don't necessarily have to throw out the baby with the bathwater in this uh, yeah, in this instance. Before. But yeah, yeah. their challenge, as far as I'm concerned, okay, you want the Muslim world to continue to accept these hadiths because Muslims are waking up rapidly today to say i reject all of it you know and that's the yeah. natural response to somebody who thinks they who thinks they've been fooled that yeah, like, get, get, take all that stuff away from me but if the people who are purveying these hadiths are sincere they would take up the, the i'll call it now the bilal challenge because i'm the only one i've ever heard say this yeah. okay it, the, you want us to keep it okay take the name hadith off of it but invent another word Cause you, how are you going to, how are you going to introduce the term that Allah has already used for the Quran? So take the name Hadith off, find another term that you scholars get together and agree on, and then reintroduce those things, and then let people decide whether this is good for me or not, based on your non-attachment to this information as being from God, like a secondary God source gave, or secondary source that God gave us, because then you're lying to the public. Yeah, well, my brother, uh, you helped him with that so much because I've been talking with this topic about hadith with him for a long time. He was really mm. with the Salafi movement here, oh, going to the mosque mm. and stuff. Yeah, yeah. it yeah. took him a while, but well, in the last two years, he's he's come a long way, and uh, he's been listening to you, mm -hmm. and um, I. He's let go of a lot of the uh, Salafi stuff. He doesn't yeah. call himself Salafi anymore. Yeah. He doesn't good. call himself Sunni anymore. So that's good. a major change. Good, good, good. Because I never good. had the knowledge of the Arabic to, you know, make him like, I don't know. So who are you, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's right. usually the yardstick that they use, but it's the wrong yardstick. It's the wrong Instead yardstick. Instead of discussing and having a discussion. Yeah. Yeah. That makes again the Arabic language a divine language, and it's not. It's not. The, yeah. No, it's a, it's 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 a challenge and a portal, a channel 
and a porter, a portal that Allah used to convey a particular message that's considered to be the last message on that level of information. But does that say that all of the divine messages came through that language? No. Hmm. No. It would be silly to think that Allah says that he does these things and he delivers these messages through the language of the people. He always speaks through the language of the recipient. It would be unfair to a Vietnamese that lives in the mountains that's never heard of Muhammad. Totally unfair. What about the Appalachians up in the mountains? You know, you know, no, they're speaking what Fred Flintstone used to speak. <laughs> when to fly. Yeah. So what you've just done in 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 postulating that Arabic is the all in all, you're saying that the rest of the world that does not speak Arabic are lesser than you are because they are not fit as recipients for God's message. See, we don't look at all of the, the ramifications in terms of what we're establishing as what we call the truth. And wherever you see something that's going to <clears throat> give unfair advantage to a people because they were born in a particular skin or a particular language group or a particular nationality, in a particular culture and they eat particular food, then what you've just done, you've elevated their culture, which has nothing to do with the dean. That's their um, their dress up. That's how they dress up over the thing, you know, in Mauritania or so. But does it mean we have to be Mauritanians and eat what they eat and dress like they dress and like what they like and speak like they speak? No, we have to dance like they dance and sing like they sing. Not at all. But that's what they've turned this dean into an Arab religion. Exactly. And that's been the main point that people have been trying to make that if Allah is who he is and we know he is, and his um, will for us is a universal will that applies equally to all human beings in both genders. Yeah. Then we got to get rid of the cultural trappings that scholarship yeah. on the most part has laid down for the past over 1000 years. It wasn't always like in the time of the prophet, they knew better than that. But as soon as he passed, there were people waiting in the wings you know, to just start doing their thing, to turn this in the direction of what was here before the prophet, and that is Arab nationalism, yeah, Arab supremacy, tribal rule. See, so yeah. they they started to bend it back in the dark, started to bend back in the direction of what Muhammad condemned and what the Quran outright condemns as human behaviors and human thinking. And we're in the world now, a thousand so years later with the false, mostly the false ideas. And you can practice goodness and still be under a false concept. Catholics do it all of the time. Protestants do it. The Jews, many Jews that I know, I was born in Judaism, as you know, as you've heard me say. Yeah. And I I, con I converse with Jews all of the time. Even in this latest Israeli-Palestinian conflict, you know, I, I speak to people who I know, who I trust, who are rabbis and ask for their opinions and I give them mine. You know, but it doesn't mean that we have to be enemies, but and it doesn't mean that if we believe we are under the banner of absolute truth, that what we're saying is going to be supported by scripture. In our case, the Quran, we can be talking and, and just wanting to be good by everybody with everybody and have all of these interfaith meetings and all and all of that is lovely. But even some of that violates what the Quran says we should do in instances such as, as this and in days and times such as we're living in. This is a very, very serious day and time that we're living in. Definitely. Yeah. For those for those who have faith in what their scriptures have delivered and in and in those who say that they're going to do it their way. They don't need God. See, this is a very serious day and time for both sides of the scale. If, uh, with, during COVID, I realized that um, even the in Israel, they um, they jabbed everyone. They jabbed everyone everywhere. They were one of the yeah. first countries to do so. Yeah, <laughs> they had no mercy on their population. <laughs> well, they, that told me a lot about who's who's in charge. So that's why I'm not quick to just say the Israelis. No, you can't hear, <laughs> hear what I'm saying. Now. Yeah. A lot of people just say those are Israelis. They're yeah. demons. They're devils. They're no. Why would why would they? Uh, just uh, them, yeah. I mean, like they, the first in line were folks over in Israel. 
So so that tells me that there's a there's another superseding undercover power in operation that doesn't care about the Israelis, just like there's mm-hmm. another hidden hand over here mm-hmm. in America that doesn't care about Americans. You might identify them as Americans, but when they get together in their little conclaves, they don't identify as any particular nation. They want the whole world. These are people mm-hmm. that believe in world dominance. Davos, those people, you know, World Economic Forum, these people are meeting two and three and four times a year now in public places on television. Now they're they're not even hiding anymore. They're telling you what their world, what the objective is for ruling and running the world, whether you like it or not. A matter of fact, they have to tell you what to do because you don't know how how to govern yourself. So we have to treat you like cattle. We have to mandate this for you. Psychological warfare. It's oh, like, yeah. Now, what's going to get us out of this, Metten? The, the, our understanding uh, in the Quran it will, it will protect us, it will shield us from this. Absolutely. But the true understanding, and I, I love, yeah, new but, like well, it, and that's what that, That's my point, that we have to now come into a different way of registering Quranic frequencies. We have to go now back to the origin um, and the origin of every and any, or I should say any and every Quranic word are the Arabia letters. And see, people don't think on this level. Everybody in school first learns their alphabet before they learn the meanings of words. So how is it that we came to understand the meanings of words while never learning what the alphabets mean? Yeah, it, it <laughs> baffles the mind. Yeah. How can a farmer, and it would be a farmer's interest, not a regular guy's interest. The regular guy will take the apple, as I've said on many occasions, he'll bite into the apple and he'll spit the seed out. Right? The orange is the same thing. They'll squeeze the orange juice, they'll discard the seeds. But Allah wants us to have the mind of the farmer. I'm going to say something a little deep. I don't know if you've heard me say this before. The Quran was revealed in two streams. One is an agricultural stream. The other is an economic stream. Now I'm going to give you what I just said in two of the major elements in science. The agricultural stream is the element called earth or land it's one of the four elements you got water fire land air right okay so the quran was revealed in the agricultural stream which equates with land and it was also revealed in the economic stream what old civilizations used to call trade that was the original economy trade and trade as an element is water And that's why most of your economic terms today refer to water, liquidating my assets, drowning in debt. See, all of these, you know, the the river bank. Yeah, Yeah, right. So, So we're talking about land and water. And Allah says in the Quran that corruption has appeared on both land and water. What we think is talking about the pirates when it's talking about your systems of operation. Is talking about how you do economics and how you do agriculture. Now, look, look at both of those fields of endeavor as we speak. They have both been terribly corrupted. Oof. Agriculture, that's not even real food anymore. In most the cases, soil's depleted. The, the soil's soil depleted. is depleted. We're eating, food. we're eating plastic foods now. Yes. Calling it dinner and breakfast and lunch. So this, this is why I asked, where do we go from here? The only thing that can correct it is knowledge from the one who created it. If you, if you are a computer guy and you invented a computer and the computer goes bonkers on you, who are you going to call? You're not going to call Ghostbusters. You're going to call the person who invented that computer. Hey, man, you need to come back and tweak this or correct this. Somebody was in this computer that wasn't supposed to be in it. He wasn't sanctioned. He, he wasn't qualified to tinker with your work. 
So can you please come and help us? And that's what we have to say to Allah. But when Allah does so, and he's sending help all of the time, Nunetics is a part of that help. It's not the only help, but it's a great part of the help that we need to get us back on track for understanding the Quran in the way that Allah intended. Because Allah is providing us again with the seed knowledge, information. And if you have the seed, you have the greatest determinant for what that ideation within the seed is going to produce. Now you've taken it out of the hands of the so-called scholars and the schools of thought and all of these things that developed because people said, I need to do this thing differently for me in order to um, have the greatest amount of political and economic advantage. That's what produced those so-called empires, the Umayyad, the Ab Abbasid, the, uh, the last one there in Turkey. Yeah, the Ottoman, right? That's oh, what, yeah. that's, yeah, that's, that's yeah. Uh, how quickly we forget, right? <laughs> but the point is, the point is a very short lived, comparatively speaking, very short lived. Uh, uh, when you understand Ottoman history, the last 400 years, uh, it was uh, atrocious. You yeah. Know, maybe the, it, oh, the, so many the, of the political events that occurred and uh, so much of what was uh, introduced through the ages of Muslim scholarship, which wasn't Muslim scholarship, the things that mm -hmm. happened with the, um, oh boy, man. Thank you, well, Mr. Tyler. I, yeah, Rumi, I, yeah. I, I like Rumi because I think, because um, of the, you know, the reed flute? Yeah. The reed flute contains high DMT, the reed itself. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. you can extract it out and then you can drink a tea, which the Sufis were drinking. At that time, yeah. it's a special CT that stops the um, MO inhibitor in the yeah. stomach. Yeah. So when they digest it, they have that DNT, you know, the, the pineal gland explosion. Yeah. And you can see that through Sufi art sometimes at the mosques and the stained glass windows mm -hmm. and a lot of the whirling things. Whirling dervishes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. But I think if they, yeah. if the Ottomans caught on to them, they would have cut their heads off. So that I kept it very secret. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm thinking. That's my yeah, suspicion. It's very possible. Yeah. That's a valid I, yeah. that's a valid suspicion when you understand um uh <laughs> you know, it's like the assassins, you know, <laughs> dealing with the hashish. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, yeah. People had to go undercover with some of this stuff, but they felt like they needed it as warriors or whatever to be more brave or whatever. So they indulged in it in that way. But the point is is that we can't connect those things to Allah's guidance, saying Allah yeah. said it's okay to do it this way, you know? Oh, I'm not saying that. Uh, no, I know you're not, but I'm saying people yeah, people yeah, in history yeah. will say this is a part of my religion, you know, that kind oh, of no. thing. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, when no, no, that's a part of what they introduced because people, um, as we said earlier, they like the easiest route. Yeah, uh, we've with this stuff, because it's found in Mother Nature, I see it as medicine. So if you've got like uh, issues with your ego, it helps. Mm -hmm. you sh if you've got trauma that you've held on to in the in the past, mm -hmm. it helps. It helps, you know, um, understand where that trauma is held and how mm -hmm. to deal with it. Absolutely, better than yeah. going to a psycho psychologist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's going so, to medicate you with ph pharmaceutical medication. Yeah, I've, yeah, no, same I've thing. The same thing with the study of the chakra energies, those chakra yeah. centers. Yeah, this is knowledge that's been in the world for for hundreds of, you know, a few thousand years at least. It's not yeah. new, and it helps tremendously. The human being, one aspect of the human life is chemical. The brain, the brain is chemical. You know, these things that are happening in us as major oper uh, uh, operations within the body, they are chemically related. The people who went to ancient Egypt went because they were masters of chemicals. That's why how they came to be called chem and chem, mm -hmm. you know, and alchemy, you know. So these people were masters of these things, but they passed the habitual parts of that practice on to the common people without passing on the wisdom. Yeah. So people I'm get high really now great. for just any reason. It is, that's hedonism. Hedonism, yes. hedonism for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. And people, are, people are engaged uh, topically 
in these practices without knowing the in-depth, the in-depth meaning of what it is they're doing and why they're doing what they're doing. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. for sure. There are ideas um, in the Quran that are so lofty that the average human mind can't handle it. What, what Allah is saying in many yeah. parts of the Quran. Allah is speaking about Jannah. He's speaking about, uh, uh, you know, ideas related to afterlife. And I mean, these are ideas that people sit and contemplate and meditate on and, and get spiritual around and go into dreamland. Yeah, based on those that, ideas. I've had visions like that. I felt that, like the internal paradise. Yeah. You know, the Quran, Allah says, you know, I won't change the state of a people unless they change yes. their internal state. Yes, yes. The and next. I understood that. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, once I'm, you have yeah peace in the heart. Yeah, but how many, how many people <laughs> ha have understood that? See, you're. That's why I knew. I knew when I first saw you and started hearing you talk that you you're one of the special ones. Oh, not to, not to, as you know, I'm not appealing to any ego or anything like that. No, no, but we are but, the same but wavelength, like the wavelength, frequency yeah, wise. Yeah. I know who I'm talking to, so I can say yeah. some of the things that I'm saying in hopes that other people who might hear this will benefit, who are going through the same kinds of of, of issues in the African American community, for instance. You know, we are we're a very heavily drug ridden community in, here in America. Very heavily drug ridden community. Western society is they 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 push the drugs in society so they numb themselves and they don't, you know, act yeah. in their yeah. life. Yeah. yeah. Yes, indeed. And uh, it contributes to so many maladies um, that we have to keep constantly trying to go back to see how all of this stuff got started. You know, there was a lot of stress and strain and, and angst that needed to be relieved from people who were <clears throat> recently enslaved and recently under the Jim Crow influence, <clears throat> you know, where just the color of your skin could get you hung the next day for walking on a sidewalk and a white woman's coming this way and you don't get off the sidewalk. That was against the law for you to walk on the same that, side of the, of the street. That passes on generational to generation. That's that right. Yes, genetic memory. That's right. It passes on. So as Muslims, we have to understand that these things are being addressed in the Quran. The Quran is not busying itself with rituals yeah. and trying to tell you what time to get up, what time to put your head on the floor, what time to get back up, what time to do, what time to fast. Yeah. That's not what the Quran is. You're not looking at it the right way. No. What's in the Quran, listen, not even a quarter of it has been really implemented as wisdom yet. We're just now beginning to pinch into some of the substantive meanings yeah, and I'm, messages I'm, 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 of Al-Quran. Yeah. We're just now crossing the precipice, yeah. you know, just sticking our toe past the door that will allow us to enter the truer and truest meanings of Al-Quran. Yeah. But we have to correct a lot of the immediate issues. And uh, the very fact that if you ask a person, as we said in the beginning, what I ask Muslims all the time, especially immigrant, I say, what is the fitra? Oh, I asked and, one. You know, he have, said to me, he said, you yeah. have to shave your private parts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> your pubic hairs can't come with you. <laughs> you know, if you're not doing that, you're not a good Muslim. You're not, you're not paying attention to the fitra. Brother. This is understanding of the fitra. <laughs> yeah. But I asked a brother who is practically a, a Qari. He said, I've he's never an imam too. <laughs> he said, I've never heard that word. <laughs> oh, he's an imam when you ask it. He said, I've never heard that word before. Yeah. I said, it's in the Quran. So, so what I'm saying is our, <laughs> our over-attention that was pointed in the direction of men's words, the so-called hadith, the over-attention to that, we can give you details on what the hadith say about clipping your fingernails and pulling out your pubic hairs and all of that, and you know, and just shaving your underarms. We can go with that all day long, how the prophet brushed his teeth and uh, miswhack, and if you don't use the miswhack. You can go crazy, yeah. Yeah, it's intended to drive you crazy. Three pebbles to wipe his Yeah, heart. what kind of foolishness <laughs> is that? <laughs> <laughs> now it might have worked for you during COVID when you couldn't find any <laughs> tissue. Try it today goodness. in our toilets. <laughs> Isn't that something? You know, 
Or if you stand up and pee, you're going to hell, you know. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's just a lot of, of baggage that comes along with that. When the Quran makes things simple, it simplifies things without divesting that knowledge of its wisdom. It's not simple in the sense of what a child needs to know, but it's simple enough to teach to a child until the child grows into the wisdom factors connected to it. You're a great mind. I like I like you. <laughs> yeah, we have to talk more often. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. So um I think we're about yeah. Yeah, up. we're we're about there, but uh let, let's let's do yeah. Okay, right okay. Sure, sure. Because my fact, if from, you had if you had some questions, I'm not I'm not rushing. No, I just wanted to meet you. Uh, so okay. I wanted to know how to get into the my, my actual reason why I booked the private class was I tried to join the Nunetics University online. Yes. Thing, yes. And it said the semester ended. And when on one of your videos, you said, that's it, I'm going off YouTube. <laughs> I panicked. Well, scare panicked. My scare tactic. It worked. It worked. <laughs> oh, I, had to, I had to get in contact <laughs> no. with you. No, we are. We're revamping everything right now. And I appreciate that. We're revamping everything. There's going to be a brand new website. And there's going to be a okay. brand new way to join. Um you know, we're trying to reduce the amount of things that you'll have to pay for, you know. Yeah. So from this point, actually, I should say from next week on, these meetings here will be free. Oh, so cool. the, the, the yeah. website will let you know that, that if you're a registered member and see, the point is, is that in the past, most of my uh, learners were not registered learners. Okay. They were people who just expressed an interest in genetics, and I put them on the email list and they they got links every week when the people who paid also got links every week. But it wasn't fair for me to keep these other people on who have not paid and who have not communicated with me that they even want to continue. So I took those people off the list. So now that I have a list of only people who are paid subscription members to the class, there's going to be a whole lot of extra goodies, extra added goodies that come along with each person who subscribes. See, not just subscribes to the YouTube channel, but are actually in the class as as paid registrants. So yeah, that, this is this do, is yeah. one of those perks that uh -huh. in about another week to two weeks. In other words, when you when you apply for another uh, one on one, it's yeah. free. It's free from this point on. Oh, OK. Yeah, it's just that I can't do it every week, you know, for free. No, you know? I, the, the numbers I, of people who are yeah. who are going to who are going to approach me, hey, I want a one on one. It's it's going to get. But what I'm also doing is I'm working on the individual modules for each letter. So yeah, that yeah, is cool. something that you'll have to purchase. You see, yeah, two two letters at a time. You they're yours to keep. You can listen to them, and Thanks. and learn from them. Yeah, so that's the way that we're going with that. Thankfully, my situation, we we commercially produce um, flatbread and filo pastry in Melbourne. Okay. We have a bakery. So, alhamdulillah, I'm, you know, economically fine. And, good, um, good, good. And I, now I want to be in a stage where I can help the community. I want to yes. give back because I've, I've, you know, um, I want to change. Not I'm not ashamed of my past, but I'll... What I've learned from my past, I want to help the community with what's helped me. It makes sense. Yeah. That's, that's, makes I sense. just want to shit. Yeah. What's helped me, I want to mm -hmm. help the community. Well, listen, yeah. continue to assist in genetics in any way that Allah has blessed you to be able to assist. We we're 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 on the bottom floor of our development. I don't get I don't have anybody with big pockets who are supporting me. I don't I don't want them at this point. I, I want people, yeah, organically. Yeah, yeah organically. organically. I mean, how can I preach genetics with your seed letters and not do the business part of it organically? I'd be violating my own protocol, right? So, no, I I wanted to just uh, I don't have any big posters and advertisements and you know that kind of thing. No, genetics is growing organically, as you said, it's growing naturally. Is there anything I can do to help you? Anything? Anytime you get a dime above dinner. <laughs> You send it to Nunetic. We we need all of the financial assistance that okay. we can get. Yeah. And yeah. the other thing that you can do is, you know, you can order the books from off the oh, website. Yeah. And the yeah. website is nuneticsinstitute.org. Oh, yeah. 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 So so order them for other people. Okay. Yep. Yeah. See, I, I have what I need for me and my family, yeah. but those books 
there are 20 books out now and they need to be distributed to people who you know pretty much think like you think or will be interested in the way that you're learning and and some of the things that you've been learning so introduce them to that or just simply take the youtube um link that links all of my videos on YouTube and send yep. them that one link where they can have access to, to what a hundred different videos that I've done. So yeah, yeah, yeah. that's my interest. My interest is not so much in give me money, give me money, although it's, no, needed, but my interest is more, I want to give the information and then yeah. whatever, whatever comes from that, as far as interest goes, it's Allah doing that. But my job, as is the job of everyone, including the Prophet, is to make the message clear. I totally understand. And yeah. I reckon you're doing a great job. I, sh I shared one of your videos with a friend of mine, and mm. he said, he's the BB king of imams. <laughs> you tell him, I said, thank you very much. I appreciate that. With all humility, I appreciate that. I'm and I, 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 I understand, see. When you think about what Muslims have been traditionally taught, I can understand people feeling like that. I've seen a lot of reactions to what I say and do, <laughs> just like that. Yeah. That, yeah. Where, as a matter of fact, one of the common uh, responses is, where has this guy been? Where is he from? He's been doing this for 30 years? How come I've never heard of him? Same as W.D. Muhammad. Same yeah, same Muhammad. thing. Same thing with Imam W. D. Muhammad. Where has this? Everybody hears about Minister Farrakhan and oh, it's about Malcolm and Muhammad Ali. Well, Wallace D. Muhammad, but he was so low key that because we're looking for this fire and flame kind of leader, you know what I'm saying? Somebody yeah. who's going to represent the black man. Yeah. You know, we missed one of the most precious voices of true human liberation to ever hit this planet. That's W. Dean Muhammad, Walith Dean Muhammad. Those of you out there in, in viewer land, if you've never heard of him, just Google him. He's the son of Elijah Muhammad, who we still don't know a whole lot about, even when it comes to his history. All we know is that, you know, he got some teenage girls pregnant, so we think, and then, you know, and he violated and he was just a lustful old guy, you know, but that's what they want to leave you with. The things that we know about these people are not really the lives and contributions that have come from these people. And W.D. Muhammad was just too clean for a lot of people. He yeah. was too clean. He moved out of his father's mansion. Can you imagine? Into like a three bedroom house on, you know, south side of Chicago, some, you know, Markham, Illinois, you know. So here's a man that rejected millions of dollars. He could have, he had it coming in when he became the leader in 1975 after his father died. And if you look at where Minister Louis Farrakhan lives now, just Google the National House, Nation of Islam. Yeah. And you're going to see the mansion that was given, well, not given, but purchased by Minister Farrakhan from W.D. Muhammad, from when he was the leader of the organization. Farrakhan said he wanted to, to purchase it. That, along with the main mosque there, mosque, it was called Mosque Number 2, Farrakhan, that's where he has his national meetings from right now, all right? I mean, you're talking about a place that sucks up thousands of dollars a year just in heat. They have heated carpets. <laughs> you know, you're just sitting there for Juma. And the, the heat is all, all the money is going up into the sky. <laughs> but but some people re would rather do that and, and continue the facade that we're this mighty, economically strong people when behind closed doors, that's not the case. So why are you going to continue the facade just to look good on the surface, but what's going on beneath the surface is uh, something that's going to de eventually destabilize you. W.D. Muhammad gave that stuff up and he concentrated on the Quran, economic development, and the undergird for uh, redoing, he called it remaking the world. He needed to redo those falsities, those those false uh, implants and things that were put into the community to just make us look good in front of people. You know, the FOI uniform, you know, the bow tie, yeah. you know, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. The regimentation, he had to do away with that. What, if he didn't find it, having support in the Quran, he got rid of it. No matter what the people thought, no matter how happy they were with it. You know, everybody in a bow tie, a straight tie every day, no matter whether you're going to work or not, you still had to wear the bow tie because they wanted the public to see you as something that you might not have been. Close crop, yeah. haircut, everything. Everybody had to look uniform. 
because the Honorable Elijah Muhammad had a particular method that he was taught by his teacher, who we believe was originally from what is now Pakistan. Yeah. Uh, his teacher, W.D. Farad or Farad, you know, he said he was from Mecca, but he, he you know, most of what he did was typical uh, Pakistani. Yeah. Even the words he used, the language that he used, Shabazz. I mean, there's no Shabazz in Arabia. There's Shabazz all over Pakistan. Yeah. You know, so these are the things that we're coming into gradually. And we don't use them as a means of or an excuse for dividing us because the template that Allah created is the human template. So what we try to do, no matter what your belief is, is try to reach you on the human level, your human concerns. So if we can reel yeah. that in and we find out that we have more in uh, in common than not in common, that's a part of the Tawheed that we're talking about, then the things that are superficial and topical, we, we let them be where they are. And we do our best to try to build the human edifice, the, the mind. How many people know that there's a triune brain sitting in their heads? See? How many people no know? No, they're not aware. How many people know that there are four chambers connected to the heart and what those four chambers actually represent? The Quran talks about the heart all the way through the book. Nobody's ever stopped to say, Let me examine the heart. There's even Allah's signature on the heart. And yes, I, I've, I've seen that. <laughs> I've seen that. that. <laughs> yeah, you know, there's Allah's Beautiful. signature in all throughout nature. Yeah. In, in Arabic, yeah. All throughout yeah. nature, for sure. So going back to something that I said in the beginning, that when I said that Arabic is not a special language, I'm talking about colloquial Arabic. The actual script is also fitra-based. Yeah. Because human minds can be inspired and are inspired and are still being inspired by Allah. Oh, so... Yeah. When you understand, and, and Allah, he again, Allah says that he 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 speaks to you through the language that you speak. So in that regard, it doesn't mean that Arabic is the all in all special language, because I'm sure people have discovered other other uh, signatures and scripts in their languages. In fact, the glyph that we call Allah in Arabic is very similar to the glyph that the uh, ancient Indians used to describe God. If you just turn it on its side, it's it's basically the same signature. Even if you don't turn it on its side, the glyph of Allah also looks like a serpent, a, sl a yeah, snake, yeah. a snake. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it looks like a snake that's poised to strike. You've done a video on that. I think I remember. I certainly do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. The meaning of Allah God, and I forget the, uh, the title of it, but yeah, I've got yeah, yeah I've got a video yeah. on that. That's right. So, how do you explain that? See <laughs> who who done it? Who 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 put yeah. that together? That's what. That's how I know that these ancient ideas are related. That people are always Form. learning from other people. Form and function, you know. That's Everything. what it is. Everything has form. That's what it is. I can't say that because a pyramid looks like a capital letter A, that A is a special, you know, because mm -hmm. people's minds were inspired to do that. And, you know, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But, uh, I mean, if we're going to go that far, then we have to go back to the straight line and the circle, which are found all throughout nature, all throughout the fitwa. You could yeah. make a computer without the zero and the one. Yeah. So how special is that? Exactly. As opposed to, you know, acknowledging that the word Allah is written on a tree bark somewhere, you know. Okay, but how is that? That hasn't helped humanity. It doesn't help humanity to know that, but it helps humanity to know about those zeros and ones because that is the basis for the creation of the computer. And yeah. how, how much more advanced has humanity become based Good on binary, technology? Yeah. 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 So we have to be more rational in how we assess things that we're learning and applying to the dean. We, we, we don't have to just be proud on the surface of what uh, 
the dean and the language and the culture is doing for us. Let us concentrate more on helping our local situations, beginning with our families. How is that knowledge helping me and my family? Are me and my family tighter? See, are we more progressive? Are we more intellectually astute from our reading of the Quran? Mm -hmm. And if not, why not? And let me make the corrections while I can. That's what I, that, that's what I want for my family and my uh, kids growing up. That's, that's yeah. what the basis of this dean is all about. The collectivity in the dean, what they call yeah. Juma, Juma, and I'll, I'll be speaking on those things soon. Yeah. But the reasons for these things are not what yeah. they've told us. Yeah. Not what they've told us. Have, have you heard of Metcalf's law? Metcalf's law, network effect. No, I haven't. They use it in crypto where um, if you say there's 10 users in a system mm -hmm. and then 10 users onboard another 10 users, which uh, creates network effect. You get okay. a um, greater network effect. Oh. Could you spell Metcalf. that out for me so I can look that up? Metcalf Law. I can send it to you in an yeah, email. Yeah, please do so. M yeah, Metcalf yeah, Law. I definitely need to look into that for sure. And practically, that's what Dawah is. Like, if we can do Dawah to 10 people and they do Dawah to 10 people. It's a Fitra method. <laughs> Yeah, just look at how nature replicates. Yeah. Yeah, Allah gives it to you in the Quran. Created us min nafsin wahida. Yeah. Then zawjaha. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Then three and more from there. It's all mathematics. If you want to call yeah. it divine mathematics, because it's a principle that Allah uses all throughout creation to replicate everything, you know, including the universe. The universe was created min nafsin wahida, but not soul like we talk in soul. Yeah. yeah, it's a principle that Allah is laying down, not necessarily a literal verity or, a, you know, you have to follow this strictly as a soul. No, that's why some people say created from one essence. You know, a lot of people don't like to translate nafs as soul. There are some problems with that. There are problems with some who translate uh, ruh as spirit because these are simplified words used mm -hmm. to explain very heavy, heavy, heavy wisdom. So nunetics is the only science that I know of because it deals for letter, it deals letter for letter. It's the only science I know I know of that can come as close as you can come right now until somebody else, <laughs> you know, is given something else. This is the closest that you can come. Yeah. And then we're going to begin to add some gematria because it's not just the letter. It's also the yeah. number. Yeah. The that's, number that's factor. My, that's my, that's what I. Yeah. Love. So we'll, we'll yeah. be getting there. Maybe you'll be assisting, <laughs> you'll assist me in that. Yeah. Maybe that's why Allah sent you. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to go get my day started. Actually, this is my day getting started. And uh, I'm so thankful. Thank and, you very much. Um, my, my, cup, my cup is full right now just for meeting with you. Uh, Alhamdulillah. Uh, may Allah. Increase your network effect. I'm going to send you that. I mean, uh, inshallah. Yeah, please, please send that to me. And uh, inshallah, you know, don't let two weeks go by before we do this again. Yeah, I, I want to know how to join the cl classes. Will I You're, you've, joined the cl you've joined the class. Everything oh, that we okay. do from this point. I took this week off, so that's why you haven't heard from me. But oh, okay. uh, or you should have heard from me. You're on my email list. So. Keep checking yeah. your emails that come from me. Sometimes they'll go into your spam box, so be aware of that also. Yeah. But I, I sent out an email yesterday saying that uh, we're starting, you know, semester number 23, and that uh, there are going to be some changes and blah, blah, blah. But definitely be on the lookout. You're going to receive something from me in the form of an email on a weekly basis to let you know. And like at this point, our next class is going to be Friday instead of Sunday. It'll be Friday okay. and Sunday, but because I didn't do a class uh, this past uh, Sunday. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to make up for that class on Friday because we're switching web we're switching website portals. I'm, we're going to be with Kajabi instead of Zoom. Okay. We're yeah. with Zoom right now, but we're going to yeah. be with Kajabi. And I'm, I'm still figuring out, <laughs> you know, the, 
the ins and outs mm -hmm. of that program. But it's going to be a major step up for us. We'll still be on YouTube and we'll still be on Zoom for these kinds of conversations. But for yeah. the bigger the, the bigger classes and, and a lot of the other teachings that we have to do, that we don't need to be uh, uh, given strikes by YouTube and that kind of thing because we said what they didn't like, you know, that kind of thing. Um, that's why we're switching and we're not going to have any problems being silenced. I totally agree with the side comments you say sometimes about the Maui and the pedophilia and the, yeah. even here, yeah. the Australian government, two oh. prime ministers got caught for pedophilia and yeah. the court suppressed it. Yeah. And the yeah. judge, police, police officers. It, yeah. That's, that's, I just, yeah, I, I just want to save my children. And whoever I can help. Yeah. That's well, I actually started an organization two years ago that I didn't follow through on because it just wasn't time, but it's called Rescuing Our Children. Uh, and the the acronym is ROC, R-O-C. Yeah. So the audience will be hearing more about that also soon because there's so much abuse of our children that is going on while we're worrying about superficial stuff. They have underground tunnels, tunnels throughout this country, probably your they country. They harvest them. They harvest. Oh, them. harvesting organs as soon as oh. a, a, a disaster occurs. It happened in Haiti when the Clintons were out there. Terrible, terrible. They were they were airlifting these these children after the the uh, earthquake there and people would just disappear. They're still talking about a missing, what, 800 children in Maui. Where'd these children go? Where did the 20 school buses go? They have, and I, I've seen their layout of it. They are actually underground tunnels in Maui, in places of Maui. So Yeah, I, I've seen footages around the world, massive tunnels. In New York, tunnels. New York, there are tunnels. So these are things that we don't learn about in school. We don't learn about them through our history books. You have to know them to know them. You have to know what's being spoken of, what the sources of these things are, how to verify these things. And it should register on the average one of us, if we call ourselves human, it should register that our children should be our most important um, gift, blessing. Man, you know, they, what a gift, what a, what a blessing. But if they can contaminate the children, which they're trying to do now psychologically with all of this gender bender stuff that they're pushing, wow. see? Then they have they don't even have to worry about our generations anymore. No. You're in your 40s, I'm in my 60s. But yeah. they, they can just not even worry about trying to to correct anything on our level if they have the children. Psychologically, emotionally. See, they're, they're, they're tied into the child's very nervous system now. So that when you come to them with the truth, they automatically are repelled. And that's what we're fighting against. What is the weapon that we need to fight against all of this evil doing? I go back to my original answer, the Quran, the Quran, but not as it has been taught to us for the past thousand mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. You Just have that to be word, taught. Mm -hmm. man means mind. Oh, yeah. yeah. That says it all. But it, it says it all up until <laughs> it, it says it all if you're willing to investigate what the mind is. You see, so most people don't. Yeah. They hear it, but they don't think. That's why I keep making those consonantal connections. Mind, moon, man, the moon reflects light, yeah. the mind reflects information. Yeah. You, know, you have to be, and it's some, at some point you got to sit down and at your window at night and look at the moon. Oh, yeah. And say, mm -hmm. wow, the word moon has M and N and the word man has M and N. What do they have in common? Now, if you don't know anything about the letters and what the letters mean, you're still lost. So nunetics is a brand new science that's intended to elevate the human intellect. The intellect is one of the most important topics in the Quran. Allah says, do they not use their reasoning? The Akal, Yaqilun, yeah. do they not use their reasoning? Allah didn't say, do they not feel in their hearts, you know, pity? No, you, man, most of what you need to navigate out of this mess, you're going to need an activated intellect. And if you can activate that intellect, you just a stone's throw away from activating the pineal, but you don't have to smoke nothing to do it. I totally agree. I totally agree. I totally agree. <laughs> yeah, Mother Nature can activate it if you know where to tap in. 
psychologically, emotionally. You do you anyway know. by breathing. You, That's like, what the breathing is for. If you know how to breathe, we most of us don't yeah. know. Santos Bonacci, he's a master at it. Yeah. But most people have no clue how to activate the pineal simply through the breathing, the connecting with the Ida, the Pingala, the Soshumna. See? Is this so fluoridated? <laughs> yeah. And it's, cal it's calcified. It's calcified. You got to know how to get rid of the calcium deposits first. <laughs> That's another artificial ceiling. They put one here at your solar plexus so that you can't rise above that energy. And then they yeah. put one right here in the sixth chakra so that you, you can't have that pineal gland and its energies activated. See, so they keep us in this material realm wrapped up by material concerns. And that's why most of us die sadly in sadness and depression because the human life is meant to elevate above material yeah. concerns. That's the true resurrection of Christ. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. Right. Okay. Sorry, I kept you so long. You didn't keep me. I just me want long. to say, you know, my my, my 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 wife's from Ethiopia. Okay. And you're oh. Speaking about, yeah. She's from the Oromo community. Mm -hmm. the Muslim. The, mm -hmm. Do you know anything about their language? I do not presently, but I I would yeah. appreciate if you bring me some information on that. Oh, because yeah. yeah. A few years ago, I was saying them when they when they switched. Uh, I don't know if it's prime minister there or president, but when they switched leadership there, uh, I was very impressed by. Yeah, 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 I was very impressed by him because one of the first things he did was try to eliminate, at least on the surface, their situation regarding the homeless. So he took everyone off the street. He gave them a shower and a shave and a, and a, and a haircut. Yeah. And he gave them at least what they needed to present themselves for employment or just to feel better about themselves. And I appreciated that. And I think it was Abu Dhabi, if I remember correctly, that offered them, that offered to set up an educational system for them. And he rejected it. He rejected I thought, it. He said, I, I don't want your master <laughs> move. Well, he said, we'll do it on our own. Boy, I love it. We'll teach I, you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So I said that to say in my closing remarks that when I heard that about maybe two two years ago now, I said, that's the place for nunetics. That's the place for nunetics. Well, inshallah, my I've got, you know, three children that will hopefully be there in the future. Inshallah. How old are they now? My eldest, Musa, is five. Yeah. Isa is three years old and yeah. Iman is nine months. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, listen, let's get that linguistic party started more sooner than later. Yeah. Especially yeah. for that five year old. You probably see me with Mahdi. I started with him. I think he was either 10 at the time or 11, and he just turned 12. So I've been with him for a little over a year now. And he, Man, oh man, his new school there where he's at in Kentucky, they say there's no stopping him. His mind is just on a whole other level. Yeah. Even Musa, I, yeah, I've been telling him about the, um, you know, the Grimm's Law, about the guttural and yeah, how to yeah. identify the words. Yeah. And he, every day he's coming up to me and he goes, Oh, does banana start with B? You know? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. He's on his oh, way. Yeah, yeah, Musa, he's on his way. He's about to go deal with Firaun. <laughs> He's got to know these things early. <laughs> All right, my brother. Appreciate you, man. We'll Thank talk you. soon, inshallah. Inshallah. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.